What is this jihad? Is this fighting? No. This ayah is in Surah Furqan. Do you know where Surah Furqan was revealed? It was revealed in Mecca, in which fighting was not permissible. And so the jihad here, وَجَاهِدْهُمْ bihi With the Qur'an, with the proofs in the Qur'an. And so these are just some of the lessons that we can extract and use for the modern age. And this is the seer of the Prophet This is a miracle in itself. In itself. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Now the speaker of this session will be Brother Abdul Bari Yahya and he will be addressing the topic of practical lessons from the seerah for the modern age. A bit of a background about our brother Abdul Bari Yahya. He was born in Vietnam during the Vietnam War and later immigrated to the USA with his family. After completing his primary and secondary education there, he began his studies at the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. Upon graduating from the Islamic University of Medina's College of Sharia, Abdul Bari Yahya returned to Vietnam and Cambodia and became a teacher and director of the Revival of Islamic Heritage Society in Cambodia and the Umul Qura charity organization in Vietnam. He currently resides in Seattle, USA, along with his family, and is an instructor with the Al-Maghrib Institute, an organization that provides trademark double weekend seminars, leading students towards a bachelor's degree in Islamic studies. He is also currently the Imam of Masjid Jami' al-Muslimin in Seattle. So I would like to invite to the stage our beloved brother Abdul Bari Yahya to address the topic of practical lessons from the seerah for the modern age. Brother Abdul Bari Yahya. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa sayyati a'malina man yahdihi allahu fala mudillalah wa man yudlil fala hadiyalah أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وَمَنْ يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا أما بعد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatih the first ayah the first verse إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا Indeed we have given you the clear victory. We have given you the clear victory. What victory was this that happened during the time of the Prophet ﷺ? Did the companions defeat an army? How many soldiers did they capture? What country or what city did they conquer? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is a clear victory. What is this clear victory? When we look at the asbab and nuzul, the reasons for the revelation of this ayah, this victory is the victory of peace. This victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls 
Hatham Mubina. A clear victory came after the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah. In the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet وسلم, agreed with the Meccans and Quraysh to have an armistice. In other words, peace and no fighting. They had been fighting before this in the Battle of Badr, in the Battle of Uhud, and also in the following battles that came, and then peace occurred. This peace was called Fatham Mubina. That's why in Islam, the true victory, the clear victory, is the victory of peace in which you avoid confrontation and avoid fight. And this was very beneficial for the Muslims. Because after this, after this agreement or this pact and treaty, there was peace in the Arabian Peninsula. Anyone who wanted to join the Muslims, they can ally themselves with the Muslims. Anyone who did not want to join the Muslims, they could ally themselves with the Meccans. But anyone who allied with one or the other, they had to respect this peace treaty. And because of that, oh, 1400 people went to Mecca to perform Umrah. And this was when the Treaty of Hudaybiyah occurred because they could not go into Mecca. The Meccans prevented them from going in, but they gave them provisions to go next year. But during that trip, there were 1400 people, Muslims, who joined the Prophet ﷺ. In less than two years later, the next trip that they went after the Umrah of the following year, the next trip, the major trip that they went, they had over 10,000 Muslims who went back to Mecca just in less than two years. Why? Because so many people accepted Islam. What does this show? This incident shows that Islam prospers in peace and not in war. Islam prospers in peace. Why? Because more people accepted Islam during the few months after the treaty than over 19 years of da'wah in Mecca and Medina. When there was peace, Islam spread. And this is just one of the lessons that we can take from the seerah or the biography of the Prophet ﷺ. During this occasion also, during the time in which the treaty was being agreed upon in the meeting with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and Suhail ibn Amr representing the Quraysh in Mecca. During this time, before, right before this, when the Prophet ﷺ was prevented from going to Mecca, and first of all, they were not supposed to prevent the Muslims. This was an inalienable right of anyone who wanted to come into Mecca peacefully to make Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage. They were supposed to be allowed to go in freely. But the Meccans, they went against their own tradition and prevented the Muslims from going in. So, during this time, one of the reasons why the Meccans wanted peace also, was because of war, their economy was in shambles. The trade routes from Mecca to Asham, but they were being impeded because there was no peace. And that's why they also wanted peace. And that's why the Prophet wasallam he said, the Meccans, the Quraysh in Mecca, if only they would have allowed me to freely call people to Islam, they would have stood to gain. They would have gained in position and everything else. But they tried to prevent 
the Prophet ﷺ from doing so and they expelled the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And because of the war and so forth, their economy was in shambles. It reminds us of the time that we are living in right now. In just the few years of the incident of the attacks in Iraq and so forth, the United States of America, they have spent billions and billions of dollars into this war. Recently, just I read an article and they were calculating the amount of money and what you could have done with that money instead of making bombs and guns and taking care of the troops and so forth. If they were to use that money to spread peace instead of war, you know what they could have done? You know what America could have done? America could have alleviated poverty from the face of this earth. Not a single poor person on the face of this earth. Instead of using it for war, if they used it for peace, imagine no poor person on the face of this earth and everybody has enough to eat. They could have alleviated poverty from the face of this earth with that same amount of money. And that this is what also happened to the Quraysh because of the war. And so, in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, there are lessons. And Islam is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the final religion revealed to mankind. There will not be another prophet who will be sent to us until the day of judgment with the exception of Prophet Isa alayhi salam who will come back and rule by the sharia ah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, except for Jesus, his return. But the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the legislation will be used and it will be ongoing until the day of judgment. And so the lessons in the seerah and in the Qur'an are applicable even in our times. Now what are some of the other lessons that we can extract from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ? Let's start from the beginning of Revelation. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ was in Mecca. In Mecca there was great oppression. The rich and wealthy, the aristocrats in Mecca, they took advantage of the poor. There was widespread oppression widespread lewdness. So much so that they even used to make the waf circumambulate around the Kaaba naked. Not a single clothing on them. Their morals were deteriorated. And so, because of all the oppression, because of all the evils, especially the shirk, the worshipping of idols and so forth in Mecca, a person who is of the fitrah, in other words, a person who is in his natural state towards good, like the Messenger of Allah was, he saw people being oppressed. He saw people being harmed. He saw the rich taking advantage of the poor. And he saw the way the society was. When he was near or around the age of 40, 40 years of age, he started to seclude himself. Why? To reflect upon the society because he wanted to change and do something about it. Naturally, somebody who is of good heart, when they see evil, they naturally want to change. But how? So when the Messenger of Allah was at the age of 40, living in this society, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him the first verses of the first surah that was revealed. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. 
اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم These were the first verses revealed to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم The first word in the Qur'an that was revealed was Iqra, read, recite. Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaqa. Read and recite in the name of your Lord who created. This word caused a revolution in the Arabian Peninsula. The Bedouin Arabs who were looked down upon as second class people. They rose from the desert and they became the scholars of the world. Because of Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq, read and recite. Education is of utmost importance in Islam. Read and write. And they were an illiterate nation. Education. It's so important to learn how to read and write that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the Muslims captured 70 of the prisoners after the battle of Badr, when they captured 70 of the prisoners, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed them to ransom themselves. Their families could pay for it. But there were some people who could not afford to pay their ransom to be freed after their capture. So, what happened? The Prophet ﷺ said, if you teach 10 people from the children of Medina, or from the Muslims, 10 to learn how to read and write proficiently, to learn how to read, then they would be free. The people in Medina, they were farmers. Many of them did not know how to read. The Meccans, they were merchants and businessmen. So most of them knew how to read. But after this, after this, because you know, if you are captured, if you get to teach 10 people and they know how to read correctly, properly, you get freed, you want them to learn as quickly as possible. You're going to be the best teacher you can be so that this guy will learn quickly. You get 10 people and you get to go home. So that shows also the importance of reading and writing and education, especially at a time that we're living in when there's trials and tribulations, there are evils in the society, degradation of the society and so forth. You see what happens? Education is very, very important. And that's why the first ayat that was revealed was Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khala. And then, what is the next? Surah that was revealed after that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after you learn how to read, you're right, you educate yourself. What do we do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Surah Al-Muddathir, the first few ayats of that surah. Ya ayyuha al-Muddathir, قُمْ فَأَنْذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِّرْ وَالرُّجْزَ فَهْجُرْ وَلَا تَمْنُنْ تَسْتَكْذِرْ وَلِرَبِّكَ فَاصْبِرْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ya ayyuha al-muddathir O ye who is covered up in your blanket Now the time to sleep is over Get up and warn. Get up and deliver the message. You have to get up and deliver the message. The Prophet ﷺ said, Balli wa anni wa ayah. Convey what you have from me, even if it's one verse only. So the next step in a society, especially in a non Muslim society, most people fail to understand. They don't realize that the Prophet ﷺ for the first 13 years of the da'wah, the first 13 years after revelation 
He was living in a non-Muslim society. He was living in a non-Muslim society. So the lessons that you can extract from that period, they are invaluable. They are precious. This is something that we as Muslims, especially those living in India, in the West, in Europe, in Australia, anywhere else where you are a minority, extract the lessons from there. Because the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, they were living as minorities in a non-Muslim society. So, we as Muslims, if we are living in such a society, we have to convey the message of Allah to others. In America, in America, I don't know how it is, if it's similar probably here. In America, the average American sees over 3,000 ads or adverts a day. Somebody trying to tell you that you need this and you need that. You have to think this way and that way. So you end up buying things you do not need with money you don't have, just like the previous speaker spoke about, to impress people you don't even like. That's what they want you to do. But you know, as Muslims, we don't go into debt. We don't borrow money unless it's an emergency, unless we really need it. We don't borrow to get things we don't even need. To raise our lifestyle, no. You borrow when it's an emergency. Borrowing or being in debt is so shunned in Islam that the Prophet ﷺ, before praying on anyone, praying for anyone after they have passed away, if you bring a janaza, somebody who has just passed away, and you put that in front of the Prophet ﷺ, you know what he asked? Does this person have a debt? Did he ask, oh, did this person used to drink alcohol? No. Did this person used to commit this sin and that sin? No. What did he used to ask? Did this person have a debt? And you know what he would do? If that person did have a debt, he would say, go ahead, you guys, pray for him. I'm not going to do it. That's how serious it is. And that's why we as Muslims, if you practice Islam correctly, you wouldn't be worrying about this economy and the economy would not be the way it is. So, in the non-Muslim society, just like during the time of the Prophet wasallam, in the time in Mecca, during that time, where the majority were non-Muslims, and they were against the Muslims, and they were actually torturing Muslims even during those days, one of the most important things that you do is make da'wah. You have to convey the message that you have. If you do not convey what you have, you don't convey Islam to others, then they will change you. If you don't make da'wah, they'll make da'wah to you. Because every single day, when you're driving out there, you see billboards after billboards after billboards. On the TV, even on people's shirts, they're trying to make you think the way that they want you to think. Trying to change your ideals, trying to change your morals on TV every single day. And other places also. And so, as Muslims, you have to قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ Stand up and warn. What's the next surah that was revealed? What's the next one? Because this will form the basis of how to survive in such a society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed after that. Ya ayyuhal muzzammil Qumil layla illa qalila Nisfahu awin qus minhu qalila أوزد عليه ورتل القرآن ترتيلا إنا سنلقي عليك قولا ثقيلا 
Ya ayyuhal muzammil, O ye who is covered up in your blanket, it's time to get up. Ya ayyuhal muzammil, qumi layla illa qalila. Stand up at night except for a few parts of it. In other words, you should be standing up for most of the night. Standing up doing what? Subhanallah, the Qur'an has just been revealed. The first few surahs, Allah is telling you to do what? Already? Stand up at night time to pray the Hajjud. Already? Ya ayyuhal muzzambil, qumi layla illa qalila, nisfahu awinqus minhu qalila, awzid alayhi wa rattilil Qur'ana tartila. Or increase more than half of the night and recite the Qur'an with the proper recitation and reflection. Why? Because you're going to need it. Educate yourself. Iqra. Qum fa'anzir. Stand up and deliver the message. And then when you've done all of that, at night time, when everybody is asleep, you come home and rest? You rest a little bit. Stand up again. And strengthen your connection with Allah. Because you're going to need it. In a society like this, you're going to need the strength in this connection with Allah. قُومِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا نِصْفَهُ أَوَنْ قُسْ مِنْهُ قَلِيلًا أَوْزِدْ عَلَيْهِ وَرَتِّلْ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا إِنَّا سَنُلْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا Indeed, we're going to reveal to you a heavy word. This message is a serious message. Your life is at stake. This world and the hereafter. It's a heavy message. It's not a joke. Go forward and deliver this message. So remember this. Iqra. Recite, read, education. And the most important type of education that you're going to need is you're going to need to educate yourself with what? With the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet And you need to deliver the message. If you don't take this responsibility, you will see your Iman coming down and down. And then, in strengthen your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this society also, during the time of the Prophet wasallam, the Muslims were being tortured greatly. Some of them, like Khabbab ibn Aratz, he said, when he was asked by Umar ibn Khattab, he said, O oh Khabbab, what was the worst that you faced in Mecca? Because he was one of the early Muslims. And so he said, what's the worst that you faced in terms of torture from the Meccans when you were Muslim? He just said, just look at this, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. He opened his back and he said, look at that. Umar ibn Khattab, he looked at it and he said, what is this? I've never seen something like this before. I've never seen anything like this before. What is this? He said, the Meccans, because he accepted Islam, because he said, La ilaha illallah, they used to put out their fires with his back, burning coal, putting his back on it. You know, when you need to turn off the fire, what do you do? You go get water, right? So you can turn off the fire. You can put out the fire. But you know what they used to do? They used to use his back to do that until he could hear the sizzling of the burning from that, from the coal. And this is what they face in Mecca. The Muslims, the Prophet ﷺ even said, يَأْتِي عَلَيْكُمْ زَمَان There will come a time, القابض على دينه كالقابض على الجمر The person who holds on to Islam, to hold on to his religion, 
will be like a person who holds on to burning coal. Let me give you some burning coal and see how long you can hold on to it. But that's what the Muslims faced during those days. And the Muslims were being tortured in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were being tortured. Sumayya radiallahu anha and Yasir and Ammar mother, father, child all three both of Ammar's parents Sumayya and Yasir they were both killed Sumayya she was killed by a spear that was put in her private part that's how they killed her they killed Yasser, they ripped him apart. While they were torturing, while they were torturing this family, the Prophet ﷺ walked by them. What do you think he did? He loved them very much. The Muslims were weak. Do you think he went and he beat those people up? He didn't resort to violence. He said, Sabran ya ala yasir, fa inna mawidakum al jannah. Be patient, O family of Yasir, because your position is in paradise. You have a place in paradise. You have a promised place in paradise. Be patient. What do we learn from this? What we can extract from this is that sometimes as Muslims, Especially in the times of weakness, especially when you're a minority, when you don't have the strength, you want to change things. And you might see Muslims being tortured, but it's out of your hands. And you can't do anything about it. Muslims being tortured by the thousands in the Middle East every day. We hear the news, we hear it so often, we have become desensitized, we don't even feel any sense of mercy, compassion towards them anymore because we hear it so much. That's what has happened. So we hear this and we see things being done to the Muslims. What do we do? Sometimes if you can't help them, then help them with all that you can. But sometimes the only thing that you have is dua. But what do we learn from here? We learn that when you see certain things happen, don't act with your emotions. Be wise. Don't let your emotions take over. And then by you being violent and doing things that are irrational, you cause more problems for the Muslims. And the masajids will be closed. And the Muslim Islamic schools will be closed. And conventions like this to remind us of Allah will not happen because of a few people who are not using their minds. They don't go back to the scholars. They're acting on emotions alone. The Prophet did he not love this family. He loved them very much. And he had more compassion than any one of us will ever have in our hearts for the Muslims. But he didn't make him act irrational. And that's another lesson that we can learn in modern times from the seer of the Prophet Wasallam. Another lesson that we learn also, I remember I spoke about the prisoners. I want you to compare the treatment of prisoners by Muslims. And then I want you to read and watch documentaries on Guantanamo Bay and on secret places that how the prisoners are being treated and so forth. During the time of the Prophet wasallam, when people were captured, the prisoners were put in the masjid. And in fact, some of them became teachers, as I mentioned earlier, teaching the children. These are prisoners. But you know what else they got? They got the best treatment. In fact, the people of Medina were encouraged to bring food from home to feed the prisoners. 
And you know what? Hey, if you're going to bring food from home to feed the prisoners, what are you going to bring? Are you going to bring leftovers? For us, we might think, like, yeah, I'll just bring leftovers. Okay, if I have to, yeah. let me give them something. Yo, you know what they did? They gave them the best portions. If something was burnt, they would keep it at home. Let's eat this ourselves. Let's give the prisoners the good part. That's how the Muslims were. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa revealed also concerning the treatment of prisoners. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيُطَعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ And they feed, they give food to the poor. وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ Because for the sake of Allah, for the love of Allah alone, the poor, miskina, وَيَتِيمَ And the orphans, وَأَسِيرًا And the prisoners of war. Imagine, you know what that's equivalent of? That's how the prisoners were treated during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why the majority of them, they said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Afterwards, because it affected them so much of the treatment of the Muslims towards them. Because in Islam, we are ordered to be kind. And we are ordered to be good to the orphans and the needy. And we are also ordered to be kind and treat even the prisoners of war. Who are these people? They had just tried to kill you just a few days ago. Now you're going to give them the best food? That that's how we have been taught by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Islam prospers in peace. Another lesson that we can take and learn from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And there are many, many lessons that we can take and learn. But when it comes to da'wah and propagating this message of Islam to others, sometimes you find opposition. You find certain things happening. There are lessons in how to behave and so forth. When some of these things happen, one such incident occurred in the month of Rajab, which was a holy month, a sacred month, in which fighting was forbidden. And the Prophet ﷺ sent a group of Muslims on a very important expedition. They were at war with the Quraysh. So he sent Abdullah ibn Jahsh in a group of eight men. This was so important and so secretive that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sealed, sealed up the instructions and the whereabouts they were to go. And he said, he to Abdullah ibn Jahsh, he said, take this with your men and travel for two days. Just travel for two days. After two days, open it up and you'll find instructions in there. If somebody came and asked, Asked the Abdullah ibn Jash, where are they going? They wouldn't even know themselves. Well, we don't know where we're going. Well, what, where are you going for? Uh, we don't know. They wouldn't know until two more days until they could open up the instructions. So they went for two days. When he opened up the, Abdullah ibn Jash opened up the instructions. He said the Prophet ﷺ has told us to go to Nakhla, the backyard of Mecca. For information gathering. He didn't tell him to fight. He didn't tell him to, he said, just make, just, Look and track the caravan routes. I just, this is for information gathering only. Go there with your men and keep an eye on the, the caravan routes, the Quraysh. And this was the end of the month of Rajab. And so, Nullah ibn Jash, he arrived at Nakhla. There, they found a caravan. The Prophet ﷺ had tried previously to impede the caravan routes, but he was not successful. And so this time, Abdullah ibn Jahsh, when he saw the caravan, a Meccan caravan, that had a couple of people taking care of it, they started to look at each other and they said, you know what, this is a perfect opportunity. We can 
regain our wealth and so forth because the Meccans had taken a lot of wealth from the Muslims, expelled them. And so this is a perfect opportunity for us to go in and overtake this caravan. So they decided to go and this was the last day, the last day of Rajab, which was a sacred month according to Arab tradition. There was no fighting in the month of Dhul Hijjah, Dhul Qa'dah, Muharram and Rajab. These months you don't fight. These were the peaceful months. Traditionally, you're not allowed to fight. And so, they decided to do it anyway. Because it was the last day, they said, if we don't overtake the caravan today, they will go into Mecca tomorrow and we will not be able to. So they decided to overtake the caravan. They captured two people. Amongst the people in the caravan, Al-Hakam ibn Kaysan, he was captured. Later on, he accepted Islam. And the other person, that was captured with Uthman ibn Abdullah. And one of them, Nawfal, he escaped. And there was one person who was hit by, struck by an arrow, and he was killed amongst the people in the caravan. His name is Amr al-Hadrami. Amr ibn Hadrami was killed. So Nawfal, he returned back to Mecca, and he told them of what this expedition, these Muslims had just done. When Abdullah ibn Jahsh and his men returned to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard about what they did, he was very angry. He was very angry at them because they were not supposed to do that. And then at this moment, in Mecca, they were spreading propaganda. The Muslims, they are blood hungry. They don't respect our way of life. They don't respect our traditions because they have killed during the sacred months. They have no respect for our traditions. They don't respect our way of life. And so, the, the Prophet ﷺ of course was very angry. Pretty much they were calling these people, the Muslims they're calling, in modern terms, terrorists. The Muslims are terrorists. And propaganda was going around in the Arabian Peninsula. Amr al Hadrami, a Qurashi, was killed by the Muslims in the month of Rajab. Sacred month. And you know, sometimes amongst Muslims, we have some Muslims who are ignorant or they do something that they're not supposed to do. And they are causing problems for us. And now the, all the media is just picking it up and it's all over the news. What are Muslims supposed to do? What can we say? How do we respond? What do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed? How do we respond? Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not even take the prisoners. He didn't take the booty or the spoils that came from the caravan, the goods. He didn't take it. He didn't order them to do that. He didn't take it. He was very angry at them. This was a mistake that they made that they shouldn't have done. But it was a mistake. But non-Muslims are making it, are blowing it bigger, and magnifying it, and spreading propaganda all over about that. So what did Allah subhanahu wa reveal? In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa revealed an ayah. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ قِتَالٍ فِيهِ قُلْ قِتَالٌ فِيهِ كَبِيرٌ وَصَدٌ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَكْبَرُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَتْحِ They ask you concerning the sacred months, the holy months. And fighting therein, they ask you about that. قُلْ قِتَالٌ فِيهِ كَبِيرٌ Indeed, fighting in it, in other words, killing in it, what you have, this is a grave offense. This is wrong. A grave offense. Remember the Meccans were trying to spread all this thing. وَصَدٌ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَكْبَرُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ صَدٌ means preventing people 
say fighting in it is a grave offense, but kicking and expelling people from it and causing, trying to prevent people from the way of Allah is even greater. What does that mean? The Meccans, what they were doing before in torturing Muslims, that was against their principles already. Also, what the Meccans were doing by preventing or kicking, expelling people from Mecca, the holy sacred site, its own people, that was worse. What they were doing was worse. It's worse. And so what's the lesson that we can take from here? There are some people, maybe we have some ignorant Muslims. They go out and they bomb this and do this and do that. But does that give them permission to go and bomb and kill over a million people? Thousands and thousands of people? Children, men, women, innocent people? Look at the greater picture. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, look at the greater picture. Who is doing worse? This was a mistake that was done. But it doesn't give you justification. Justification to go around and killing innocent people. And so, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Because the Muslims don't have any control of the media. And the media is controlled by people who don't like Islam, who don't like the Muslims. You know, during the time of the Prophet wasallam, what was the media? What was the media? The media during the time of the Prophet wasallam was poetry. Was poetry. Poetry was widespread in the Arabian Peninsula. Somebody was a good poet and he came up with some beautiful lines. It might not even be the truth, but it sounds good. You know, when it sounds good, people will say it must be morally correct. So, poetry was what changed people's ideas. And that was the media during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And you know the Prophet ﷺ, like during our time you have CNN, and you have things like that, CBC, you have BCC, all of these networks and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ also had a CNN. His name was Hassan, the poet of the Prophet ﷺ. And he would tell him, Uhjuhum wa ruh al Qudus ma'ak. He said, Go and attack them with your poetry. And he said, Go and attack them. And Jibreel is with you. Ruh al Qudus ma'ak. He is with you. That was the media at the time of the Prophet. So, as Muslims, we have to take advantage and try to also be strong in the media and have our own influence. This time, the jihad also for us is trying to spread this message and one of the best means and methods to do so is through the media. And Allah subhanahu wa calls spreading this message by spreading the word of Allah causes jihad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تُطْعِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَجَاهِدَهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا And do not obey the disbelievers and struggle in jihad وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ With it, a major big jihad. What is this jihad? Is this fighting? No! This ayah is in Surah Furqan. Do you know where Surah Furqan was revealed? It was revealed in Mecca, in which the principle at that time was that the kufu aidiyakum wa aqimu salah. Fighting was not permissible. Fighting was not permissible. And so the jihad here, wa jahidhum bihi, with the Quran, with the proofs in the Quran. With Islam, وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا And so these are just some of the lessons that we can extract and use
for the modern age. And this is the seer of the Prophet this is a miracle in itself. And we can take one after the other. And this can be a very long topic. But from the beginning of the seer until the end, amongst the things that makes the seer a miracle is that it is practical. And there are so many lessons that we can use even during in the internet age, the age of iPhones and WWWs and laptops can still be used. And the lessons are eternal until the day of judgment, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inherits this earth and whatever is in it. Wa jazakumullahu khayran wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'i. Jazakallah khaira, Brother Abdul Bari Yahya. I think indeed he gave a talk that did justice to the topic and brought us many valuable lessons. Inshallah, we will now have the question and answer session for 25 minutes. It'll be the same format as before. So we'll start with the first question from the mic in front. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Subhanallah, it just felt like a mini version of Shepherd's Path. Jazakallah, Shaykh Abdul Bari Yahya. Indeed, one of the Sahaba said, uh, I have never seen a person more smiling than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, My question is, in this time of stress and worry, how would you suggest us Indians to uh, follow the sunnah of the Prophet and smile? You know, smiling, of course, this is one of the, the sunnah uh, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also, he mentioned, a lot of people, they think that a person who is righteous and pious, he has this serious look. So walking in there to the masjid, this is the uncle that's going to the masjid, is pious, is like this. But you know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا ولو أن تلقى أخاك بوجه طلق He said, do not belittle a good deed. Even if you were to meet your brother, just the smile on his face. So the smile on your face, it teaches us mercy and compassion and that smile that a person has. You know, that smile that you have on your face when you smile, this builds an automatic connection and bond between Muslims. And as Muslims, we are people who are loving people, people who have mercy. And that's why the Prophet Wasallam, he used to even kiss um, the heads of orphans and the children and he used to play with them. In fact, one day the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was praying and he was making sujood, he was in prostration and his grandson, they were climbing on his back while he was prostrating. So they were kids, they were babies and kids. So they came and they started playing on his back and you know, when he finished prayer, you know what he said? He told the companions that he prolonged his sujood so that he wouldn't bother them in their play. <laughs> Subhanallah. Look at the mercy of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam towards the children. And this is something that we also, we have to have. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamukum man fil sama. Have mercy upon those on earth, and the one who is in the heavens will have mercy upon you also. So this smile is a part of mercy, it's a part of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a mercy to mankind. And we ourselves, we have to learn, if you don't smile a lot, learn how to smile. And smile towards your brother because you are getting a good deed. And so this is something that we must revive and jazakumullah khair for asking the question and reminding us of that. Yes, next question. Just before we do have the next question, just a reminder of the format of the question and answer session. Please keep what you do ask limited to a question as opposed to comments and try to keep what you say very concise and short. So we'll have the next question from the rear mic. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muzammil Sheikh and I'm a management student. So my question is, what lessons do we learn from the Sira to break the vicious circle of poverty in the business perspective? When it comes to how do you break this vicious uh, circle of poverty? In Islam, of course, we have, we have what's called zakat. 
Zakat is the rich, if they have money, a threshold, a limit, uh, which is called a nisab, then they're obligated to give. And as Muslims, we are always ordered to always give. In fact, one of the characteristics of the people of paradise is that they are not greedy and they are generous. And so if you want to enter paradise, we take care of each other and we help each other. And by doing so, you do not just help a person because you know, like they say, if you just give the person the fish and so forth, you're only going to feed them for one day. You need to teach that person to go fish himself so that he can make a living. So in Islam, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Messenger of Allah ﷺ went from Mecca to Medina, and the companions in Mecca left to Medina, most of them did not have anything with them. They left everything that they had in Mecca. So when they arrived in Medina, they had nothing. So what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He institutionalized or he organized what was called Al-Ukhuwa, a brotherhood where he paired the Muslims amongst each other. And you know, the people of Medina, they were very generous. You know what they said? They said, okay, we will take care of the people here. We will take care of the people who are coming from Mecca. We will go to work at the beginning. They said, we'll give them half. We'll, we'll give half of the land. And then they work on the other half. They're very generous. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, no, don't do that. Because why? Because the people in Mecca, they weren't farmers. So if you give them a couple of acres of land, you know, if you're used to living in Mumbai, and somebody gives you some farmland, what do you do? You probably sell it, right? You don't know how to take care of it. You don't know how to farm. You're a city guy. So the people in Mecca, they were like the urban people. They're the urbanites in that, those days. They didn't know how to farm. You give them a half parcel of land, they can't do anything with it. Because of the generosity of the people of Medina, they gave them half, but the Prophet ﷺ said, no, don't do that. He said, you know what he said? He said, instead, you work on the land and you teach him. And then when it comes to the Prophet, then you share. And many of the companions, they did not take advantage of this even. There are many incidents and cases and so forth, but, and as Muslims, we are not allowed to allow our neighbors to starve. And we want for our neighbors and our brothers what we want for ourselves also. And so we're supposed to help each other, but not only are we supposed to help each other, also we are supposed to help each other, not just by giving only, but by helping so that they can learn themselves and make a living for themselves also. And this is where the barakah will come in. This is where the blessing will come in. There are so many things in Islam that's institutionalized, but this is just one example of how Muslims uh, are supposed to help each other when it comes to alleviating poverty. And you know, if everybody gives zakat properly, you wouldn't have a single poor Muslim in the world at all, whatsoever. But it's just the people who are supposed to give zakat, they are not giving. Next question. The next question from the sister. Uh, Assalamu alaikum brother. Sheikh, can you suggest some books on Seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There are uh, a lot of books, but at the same time, there are certain, uh, you know, when it comes to the Seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have a lot of books and in terms of English. One of the simple books doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it's enough detail, is the book uh, called The Sealed Nectar. In, uh, that's translated in English. And uh, also there's another one by Ahmed Marzouk. I think uh, that's the author. It's called the, the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam according to the early sources, analytical sources. But they're both from Darul Salaam. I think we have books in English from Darul Salaam here also. But generally, these are some of the books that you can read along with others also. But these are the two in English that I know of. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, some of the stories, like if you have the classical sources like Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq, you can also read through that. But just like with many of the older books, you have to uh, verify maybe certain stories and ask. But some of the modern, like uh, the Sealed Nectar, Wallah Alam, this is one of the better books. And most of the information there is uh, sound and authentic, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, mostly. Jazakallah. 
So we'll have the next question from the next mic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah shukran, Sheikh. I'm Dr. Siraj. You said in your uh, speech that uh, in the Makkan period of uh, 13 years, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did dawah only. And uh, dawah is the only mean of uh, spreading Islam. But uh, in today's scenario, we see that we have uh, more than 1.2 billion Muslims in the world, but they themselves, majority of them, themselves they are not practicing Islam. Like we have the five pillars of Islam, and if you see the mosques, only 5% uh, people will be there offering the Salah. Similarly for the other pillars, Zakat and Hajj and the Psalm. So when we are not practicing, and only if we are preaching and more preaching, and inviting others to the Islam, and when majority of our people they are not practicing, so whether Islam will spread more by preaching or by practicing? When we say preaching and teaching, it encompasses reminding each other, not only just you know preaching to non-Muslims only, but also to Muslims. And you know, if you look at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the times that we are living right now, you see there's one difference. During the time of the Prophet the Messenger of Allah would get up and teach the people and he would be on the mimbar and would remind the people. But he didn't go after that. The leader of the Prophet during that time, he joined the Muslims and he put it to practice. And he was with them when they were eating, when walking and drinking and traveling together. And so it, was, it wasn't just the theoretical part, but it was also theory into practice. So we as Muslims nowadays, you have a lot of imams and leaders and so forth. They preach, but then after that, there's no interaction and access and things like that. They put really put into practice. And as you mentioned, that when we as Muslims, you, you know, we're, we're very weak right now. And then one of the reasons is because we're not reminding ourselves also. We also have to remind ourselves. And that's why the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed wal asr in the surah, wal asr by the time. Inna al-insana la fi khusr. Indeed, all of mankind is in loss. Illa ladina amanu. Except for those who believe, wa amilu salihat, and they do righteous deed, do righteous deeds, wa tawasau bil haqqi, and they also invite each other, or they enjoin in that which is good, remind each other to do that which is good. So this is part of the da'wah for Muslims and non-Muslims and reminding each other. So we have to do that. And after that, after that, then you have to be patient also. After reminding each other the truth, then you have to be patient. So because you're going to face opposition. And so as Muslims, the da'wah is not just for non-Muslims. You have to also begin with the family. So a lot of the times, most of the time, most of us, we live in our times and we're always blaming this and that. But we have to start within ourselves also. And instead of just putting in the theoretical aspect of Islam and spreading it, we have to start acting upon it also. And instead of blaming other people or blaming the times that we are living in, we have to start changing from the inside out, from our, each family, each individual. And that's why um, there's a poem that says, نَعِبُ زَمَانَنَا وَالْعِبُ فِينَا وَلَيْسَ لِزَمَانِنَا عِبٌ سِوَانَا We always blame the times that we are living in. But there's nothing wrong with the times that we are living in. The only thing that's wrong with the times we're really living in is us. That's the only thing wrong. Quit blaming other people in the time, but you have to start blaming yourself. And if everybody starts to take that initiative in muhasaba or taking care of themselves, inshallah, we will start, uh, you know, reminding each other from the inside, uh, every, individually, every family, and then every community, uh, and so forth, and we'll work up from there. The next question from the sister. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm a student and I'm majoring in English literature and psychology. My question is, are there any guidelines in the Sira with regards to relationship with non-Muslims around us? Jazakallah Concerning the, the guidelines with, uh, with non-Muslims, you know, not every non-Muslim is the same. You know, there are some people who 
are very harsh towards the Muslims. And there are some people who are very compassionate and also very good towards the Muslims. And we see in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu a couple of circumstances, a couple of incidents. One occurred during the time uh, in which the Muslims were uh, being sanctioned against. And this was our 8th, 9th, and 10th year of the uh, revelation, after revelation. During this time, there were non-Muslims who joined the Muslims in what was known as Shi'ab Abi Talib. This was a mountain pass that the Muslims went to live in order to protect the Prophet ﷺ at the order of Abu Talib, who was a non-Muslim. And the non-Muslims amongst Banu Hashim, they also lived with the Muslims. And during these times, we see that they were helping each other. So as long as there are non-Muslims who are helping, or they're treating the Muslims kindly uh, from this incident, then we also should treat them kindly. And in fact, when the Prophet ﷺ returned from Ta'if, when he returned from Ta'if, he could not enter Mecca. He was not allowed to enter Mecca unless he sought the protection. And you know who protected him? The person who protected him, who offered to protect the Prophet ﷺ to come to Mecca was a non-Muslim, Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. Al-Mut'im ibn Adi, he sent his children to bring, with, in full armor, to bring the Prophet ﷺ back to Mecca. And he told him to make tawaf, even with his children on each corner of the Kaaba, protecting the Prophet ﷺ. And so there were some non-Muslims who were very um, compassionate or they felt uh, they were with the Muslims in terms of in helping the Muslims and they were not, they didn't have this enmity like many of the others did. Well, so how did the Prophet some treat, for example, Al-Mut'im ibn Adi? He didn't treat them the same way as the other people. And that's why during the battle of Badr afterwards, you know what he said? When the prisoners were in front of him, he said, لَوْ كَانَ الْمُطْعِمْ بْنُ عَدِي حَيًّا He said, if Al-Mut'im ibn Adi was still alive, ثُمَّ كَلَّمَنِي فِي هَؤُلَاءِ الْأَنَّتْنَا Then he spoke to me concerning these prisoners, you know, these people, I would have freed them all. In other words, one word from Al-Mut'im ibn Adi, he would have let all the prisoners go. All of them, all the Meccans would have gone free. But he had already passed away during that time. So this shows that if they are kind to us, then we are kind to them and, and, and so forth. And so we don't just you know, paint all non-Muslims uh, with, one, with one brush, but at the same time, as Muslims, if somebody says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that Muslim is a person who does not commit shirk, who worships Allah. We should love that Muslim more than any other non-Muslims. The reason being, of course, we, we dislike him, for the sins and the acts that are bad acts, but still he has not committed shirk, which is worshiping others besides Allah or associating with Allah and worship anything. And so this is the greatest sin, is worshiping others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he has created us. And that's why if a person does good, you know, we treat them well, but at the same time we always should have this extra uh, respect because the Muslim is beloved in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has not committed the major sin, which is shirk. Because if a person commits shirk, it's like this. If somebody commits shirk, this is something that somebody has done. It is the most disliked. So whatever he does after that, that great sin of shirk outweighs, outweighs in, turn, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like your mother, okay? If the mother has a child, the mother, has a son or a daughter. This son or daughter may be not very obedient, right? Not very obedient, maybe a little bit, you know, this and that. But still, when he speaks to his mother, I mean, he's not, maybe not really good. He does, he has some traits, qualities. Maybe he's maybe mean to his friends or he does this and that. But when he speaks to his mother, he's very nice to his mother. He speaks to his mother, he's very nice to his mother. That man has another brother. That brother is very kind. Very nice to all his friends. All of his friends love him. But then when he comes home, he screams and yells at his mother. He hits his mother sometimes even. He gets very angry. Now, 
the trait that that person has, that he's very kind to all his other friends and so forth, is that praiseworthy? Which one is better? The one who, even though he looks, he's good, but when it comes to his mother, he's just, you know, he treats his mother like nothing. And he puts her down. Even though he's kind to his friend, is that tra tra praiseworthy? Is that praiseworthy? You say, which, which of the two sons is better? You say, no way, this guy here, how can somebody have in their right mind treat their mother like that? I don't care how you treat your other friends, but you do not treat your mother like this. This other person might not have the same qualities with his friends, but with his mother, he's really good. Who do you think, which one is better? The one who treats his mother, he knows at least, you know what? I might not have been very nice to my other friends, but you know, my mother is my mother. So I hope inshallah that answers. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I am a businessman. Now, I am not a very learned uh, person, but I understand from Surah Bakr and last sermon of Huzur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that riba is prohibited. But today I see, including my business, that all businessmen are involved with interest, with banking and all. Uh, my question is that, is there any a scheme that I am thinking to collect the compulsory fees from the chain of people and give uh, interest-free uh, deposits for a limited time to small tradesmen and make their business uh, riba-free for uh, and so the chain will go on collecting the funds and ultimately it will be a riba free business because today including my business we are involved in all interest so how to come out of it if you are honored with your good knowledge can throw light it will be very good for islam thank you assalamu alaikum the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said yati alaikum zamanun yafshu fihi fihi riba riba will be widespread to the point where إِذَا لَمْ يَأْكُلْهُ يُصَابُ مِنْ بُخَارِهِ In another narration, مِنْ غُبَارِهِ He said there will come a time when riba will be widespread. So widespread that even if you do not deal with riba, you will be faced with, you will be hit by the smoke or the steam of it. In other words, when you try your best, you're hit by the steam of it. So the thing is, when we as Muslims, you have to understand, that the rizq, the rizq comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The rizq, your provision, and it's already been written for you, what you get and what you will not get. And so we as Muslims, we have to purify the wealth that we have. We can't take something uh, through haram, through, through haram means. Because if you don't have blessing in your wealth, then the effects of it continue to affect your children, and it will affect you in the hereafter because you're at war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as Muslims, you try to do the best that you can, that we know that riba is forbidden. And when you're living in society where it's so hard to stay away from, you just follow the principle when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fattaqu Fear Allah as much as you can. But with each individual issues, you should try to consult with the scholars, then whether and if you can avoid it at all costs then try to avoid it as much as you can and there are a lot of people who use sometimes use riba you know the interest to try to even do good with it they said oh wait we're trying to get money but i'm going to use that money for you know good anyways like for the masjid and things like that no allah subhanahu will not accept that from you allah will not accept wealth that is not pure and so as muslims of course this is the next step that we have to we as Muslims have to come together and try to help each other in supporting each other with halal businesses. Even if you are going to uh, profit less, even if you're going to profit less, less profit that has barakah is better than a lot of profit without barakah. Because wealth that doesn't have barakah, you might have, you know, your child might become sick. Then you get into this accident and that accident. And you don't realize why it's, where it's coming from. Maybe it's coming from the haram sources that you have. So you try your very best that you can and try to help each other. Amongst Muslims, we should always support other Muslims, especially in business. And if you have a choice of buying from Muslims, 
and non-Muslims, you should always buy from Muslims and help the community. And by doing so, inshallah, with that intention, Allah will bless what you have bought also. And so as Muslims, we should always try to support other Muslim businesses all the time and strengthen ourselves. Jazakumullah khair. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa My name is Muhammad Bashir Ahmed. I have come all the way from Hyderabad to learn about Islamic teachings from the speakers. Now my question is, first of all, I congratulate you uh, educating us about the need of learning and uh, educating the illiterates, which is most important factor at this time. I have seen many people, mostly our community, that is Muslims, who are not learned, not educated and lacking. Now at this juncture, as we pay zakat, why not we spend similar amount to educate poor people in our community, which helps in turn to come forward and, and uh, march towards uh, our uh, goal. Now my question, brother, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was illiterate. He learned through Jibreel Alayhi Salaam at the age of 40 years that he have uh, informed to everyone here and most of the people read also. Now my question, brother, did he learn entire things, not only Quranic things and other things also after that period, which I want to know from you. Okay, so. First of all, when you mentioned uh, that the Prophet ﷺ was illiterate and he didn't know how to read or write. And so some people, they might think, they might say, well, you know what? This is um, something that if he didn't know how to read or write, I'm going to follow the sunnah. I'm not going to learn how to read or write. No, that's not the sunnah. You have to learn how to read and write. The sunnah is to learn how to read and write. Then why did the Prophet ﷺ not know how to read or write? The reason why the Messenger of Allah ﷺ did not know how to read or write, because this is a miracle in itself. Why? So that people will not say that he got this from reading this and reading that. And if you know, if you are receiving your information, your knowledge from the one who knows all, you do not need to go reading this book and that book. You have direct source to the one who knows everything already. So you don't need to learn how to read or write. So to him, Iqra in the Arabic language has two connotations. Iqra means to read and or to recite. To the Prophet ﷺ, it means to recite, to recite. He did not know how to read, nor did he know how to write. And as for the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, knowing about the other sciences and things like that, of course, the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ was coming directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. So any mistake that the Prophet ﷺ made, Allah subhanahu would correct them, especially when it comes to this deen. But you know, when it comes to like farming or some other types of knowledge, Whatever knowledge that you have, one of the du'as that we as Muslims have to always make, we have to distinguish, we also have to realize there is knowledge that will benefit you and there's knowledge that will not benefit you. And we always should ask Allah for knowledge that benefits us. Because some people, they spend their whole lifetime learning about one species of fish and they will know everything about that type of fish in that area and then they, they won't spend time learning about their deen. When you go in the grave, Allah will not ask you, if this fish has this certain type of eye, what do you call it? But He will ask you, who is your Lord? What is your deen? And who is this man? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also, in one occasion, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was watching a companion. And this was a, a date farmer. And he was pollinating his dates. You know, you need to pollinate so more dates will come out. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, he said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because he's not a farmer. He's in Mecca. In Mecca, they're merchants. So he doesn't know this. And so he's asking, so what are you doing? So this companion understood. Understood it to mean that this was a rhetorical question. Meaning, what are you doing? You should put your trust in Allah. You don't need to do that. You will get your dates anyway. That's how he understood it. So he stopped doing it. He stopped pollinating his, his date garden. So when it was time for harvest, 
the dates didn't come out. The dates didn't come out like the other farmers. And so he went to the Prophet ﷺ and complained to him. And then the Prophet ﷺ clarified it to him. He said, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. He said, you know more about the affairs of this dunya than me. So this is in, when it comes to farming and things like that. Yes, you know. But when it comes to whatever the Prophet ﷺ needs to know to propagate this religion, whatever the Muslims need in terms of all that's beneficial, all that's good for them in this life and the hereafter, the Prophet ﷺ has taught it to us already. Anything that's bad, anything that's haram, the Prophet ﷺ has taught everything that we need already. When it comes to that. As for the other, other issues and pertaining to the worldly affairs, all of that is halal for you unless you can prove that's haram. There is a principle in Islam when it comes to worldly matters, everything is halal unless you can prove it's haram. So if somebody comes and he drives in a car, he's in a car and he pulls up in the masjid, somebody might come, hey, what are you doing? That's bid'ah. The Prophet never rode in a car. Go look for a camel or walk to the mosque. Give me proof that the Prophet got in a car. What do you do? You don't need to bring proof because everything in this dunya is halal for you unless you have proof that's haram. But when it comes to ibadah, when it comes to worship, the default ruling is it's haram unless you have proof it's halal. It's like for example, you say Allahu Akbar and pray, you go like this. And then somebody comes and why are you doing that? Well give me proof. No, no, you give me proof because this is worship, you need dalil. When it comes to worldly affairs, I don't need to bring proof for you. You bring me proof that's haram, then I will stop. So when it comes to worldly dunya matters like uh, learning about this world, we are always ordered to, to seek knowledge. And Prophet wasallam, whatever the knowledge that he had, that the Muslims need, he gave. And everything else in this worldly matters is halal for us. You, want this, you need this, this knowledge when it comes to studies and so forth to make a living, go ahead. It's halal for you and so forth. The next question from the sister. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Alia Khan and I'm a student of psychology. Sheikh, you said during your talk that uh, acts of violence cannot be justified no matter what their cause. So what should victims of uh, injustice do if nothing is being done to give them justice? What could we take from the seerah about this situation of theirs? I didn't say uh, acts of violence uh, cannot be justified. It's just that if you're in a position of weakness and so forth, there are, you have to be wise. But as Muslims, when a person is transgressing, when a person is transgressing, somebody has to stop. And as Muslims, we stand for justice. And this religion, this deen, is built upon justice. And the only way to achieve peace is through justice. When there's justice, then there's peace. And so, in Islam, when somebody transgresses, or you know, when you have somebody stealing and doing things that are wrong, or spreading mischief, there are punishments and there are means that we take care of that. And there is jihad, and jihad will remain until the day of judgment. But there are certain circumstances and times in which that is appropriate. And in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, even though we said that Islam uh, prospers in peace, but at the same time when people are not respecting, they are the ones that are causing problems, then the Khalifa, when he orders uh, people to take care of certain situations and uh, take care of things, then it's permissible. And, th and thus, this is all uh, part of the politics and the Sharia of Islam. When you have a proper Islamic government, then uh, of course this can be taken care of. And that doesn't mean that no jihad and violence cannot be uh, justified. As long as you have to understand that there are means and methods and there are principles and so forth that we must uh, make sure we take care of when we're doing so. It's just like, even if there's war, you have uh, rules. And when you have prisoners, as I mentioned, there are rules. And so we're not allowed to kill women or the men the churches, the rabbis, or the priests, and so forth. And you're not allowed to just burn trees and houses and things like that and cause problems and mischief in the land. And so there are guidelines for that. Jazakumullah khaira. That is all the time that we have for the question and answer session. So I'd like to give a very big thank you. May Allah reward him immensely to our dear brother, Sheikh Abdul Bari Yahya.